left and right primary x and y are in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural transformation of the cell like us. That's the actual unit of okay. So what happens is a certain kind of relationship is a way of, well, the words are a little suggestive, maybe overly suggestive, but I could say a fact like this manufactures a morphism for me. Well, it doesn't do that. It actually says one must do this. Okay. So that's what's going to happen. So the reason a lot of times in categories people pull out the innate lemma, it's because they need to show there exists a certain morphism, and the easiest way to do it in certain situations is to exhibit uh, a natural transformation between what are called com functors or representable functors, which uh, we'll probably talk about. Okay? So um, you'll get there. So, but the reason I foreshadow is because what I hope to have happen this week is for you to have a really serious understanding of how all the parts fit together. Okay? That there are these different points of view, but they, they really and genuinely are, uh, you know, very useful ways of thinking that are not so obvious from from another point of view. So we get to gain mileage by shifting around in our in our, uh, in our thinking. So you might contemplate from a functional programming point of view, what would it mean to exhibit this morphism by exhibiting a natural transformation? Okay because you can do that instead. So you can say this programming problem can be solved by solving a different programming problem. So when you talk about, it, which is, involves coming up with a polymorphic functional, okay? And so when you get there, you should think about it that way. Okay? So what I would like you to encourage you to like, get used to doing is whenever some topic comes up, ask yourself, well, what does it mean in terms of programming? What does it mean in terms of logic? You know, what does it mean in terms of category? Very, very, very easy. Okay, so in fact, some of the stuff I'm going to do today, I'm pretty sure Ed is not going to um, cover. I don't think Ed, I looked at his notes, I don't think you're talking about algebra for a functor, are you? No, I'm not. So uh, that's, uh, oh well, that's just the way it is. There's only someone in so much time to lecture. So I will, I, I have to decide then whether I'm going to skip some of my plan material or not. So. Okay, so now uh, what I would like to do is I want to pick up uh, where, well, where, where all three of us are to some degree uh, from uh, last time and earlier today, and I want to carry that forward in a certain direction. Okay, so uh, what am I going to do? So here's what I'm going to now take, take as given. So let me have a, a particular uh, summary of a bunch of things that I'll take as given from the accumulation of the lectures we've had so far. And if I'm off by a little bit, I hope you can fill in the missing parts, but uh, you can also ask questions as well. So we'll do this. So here's what I'll take as, as, as given now. So what we're given is what is called the intuitionistic propositional logic, okay? Which can be viewed as, uh, probably that hasn't gotten that far yet, but it can be viewed as uh, the free by Cartesian closed category, so we'll, we'll get to see what, what that is going to be. Uh, and, uh, and, and it can also be viewed as a functional programming language by this work. So let's look at a new point of view of type theory. I'll just do the type theory. Okay, so this could be called, it's unfortunately an overused word. I could call this, uh, you know, simple type theory. Okay, and <coughs> don't, don't hold me to the terminology because people use different words for different reasons and different meanings, and that's a little confusing. Okay, so what I mean by this is we have set up, I'll just do it, I'll do it uh, very briefly. So I don't know what, I never know what notation to use. We'll say one is a type, okay, so that's the formation. Uh, we'll say that's a multiple, it might be that my <coughs> isn't the same as everyone else's, but I hope we can slide back and forth. Okay, so this could be called uh, one formation or truth formation, and this could be uh, the uh, uh, one introduction, and there's no one elimination. Okay, why? Because nothing went, there's a, uh, Frank must have used some terminology similar to this. Uh, the, the principle of it here is the elimination cancels the introduction, that's the kind of thing you're thinking about. And the point is, is that I, I like to call it the principle of conservation of proof, okay? If you don't put anything into something, you certainly can't expect to get anything back out. 
Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, you're, uh, you're, it's like energy. You're just moving stuff around and repackaging it in various ways that are more or less locally useful, but globally you're basically doing nothing. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, idea. Okay, so that's why there's no elimination because there's nothing to get back out. And then you've already had uh, that. Uh, like A cross, I'll call it A cross B as a type. Okay, if A is a type, B is a type. Okay, uh, oh yeah, I, I deliberately left room here, I'll come back to the space I have here. All right, so that's a simple thing, so that would be cross formation, right? And if M is in A, and N is in B, and uh, the pair is in A cross B. That could be thought of as and, okay, so we're, you know, we're notating and thinking about these things. And then there were two elimination rules. See, two different things went into it, so I can get those two things back out. That's the principle. So it says, if you give me something in A cross B, well, the burden of proof, eventually you'll get a proof of something called cut elimination, which will make everything I'm saying, you know, establish that it's true. But the principle of it is that well, what must the only thing what must have gone into M is two other you know terms that one of A and one of B, so I can get them back out. If I put them in, I can get them back out. So first of all, I'll just double up these rules here for the sake of blackboard convenience, and that will be possible. So we've done that. Okay, uh, you've done uh, the implication. So what we have A implies B. I'll write A arrow B. Is a type if assuming A is a type. Uh, well, no, I don't mean that at this point. I just say that A is a type and B is a type. Uh, and then, so that's the arrow formation, so some of this would be familiar. And then the introduction is a lambda, so it's an A or B. I will call that arrow introduction if assuming X is an A and a B with various variable binding conventions, which I'm not going to detail here because that would take the whole lecture itself. Uh, and so I'll rely on common sense. And I say, well, what goes into being a function is a family of elements of B indexed by the elements of A. Okay? So if you give me an index element like that, then uh, I can, the usual notation is to apply it, I can get B. That's the arrow I'll leave you space. Okay, so uh, this is sort of partly why sometimes this is written B to the A. Okay, it's sort of B exponentiated by A. It's A many copies of B. Okay, yes? Uh, would you mind switching markers? It's almost impossible to read up there. Did someone read that? Change markers. Change markers, okay. So the reason it's sometimes written B to the A is I have A many copies of B, right? And if you give me a particular A, then out of the A many copies, I will pick the nth one, okay? And I will get a B out of it, okay? So that's the, why the exponential notation is used. Okay, so then the other things are, uh, you have that, uh, that uh, zero is a type. So that's zero formation. And we have uh, no introduction. So there's no uh, zero introduction. But the idea is that this is the empty type. And the elimination says, if you were to have something in the empty type, then uh, there's different notational conventions, but one is called a board of M, and that's a type A, and that is a zero limb. And that is expressing the idea uh, that, that is expressing the idea of the, of the contradiction, that this is type is also, can also be called void, okay? And this type can also be called unit, so there's fairly typical terminology. I think my suggestion made it worse. <laughs> it's it's right here. Well, I'm, I'm using the pens I have. Okay. No, there are some other there. What am I, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to use these? No, there is another one there. This one, that's the one I just put down. I can use Try the blue, the blue one. one. Okay, I, I think it's, it's a, more of a limitation of the whiteboard. Than Okay, that's great. Okay. So uh, I was expressing, I was just about to mention the idea that these are common terminology, except that unfortunately in the seat of the pants programming world, 
Uh, this is called completely, I'm sorry, it's called boy. Okay, yeah, that's completely wrong. Okay, that, that's good. the whole business like in C of boy star, that's a utter nonsense. Okay, <laughs> Not void. Void is empty, has no value. So if you say a function returns void, what you mean is it doesn't return at all. Because if it were to return, it would have to return something. Okay, and there is no, there is nothing. So it's just a, a stupid thing. Yeah. But it's very, it's very common in, uh, in the commercial world. Okay, so it's to call a unit void. So I want to, so here we'll just call that. Okay, now I need more space than I have. So I'll go over here. Uh, and so the last thing, well, I have some more to fill in, but the last thing is, uh, uh, is the, the disjunction of the sums. Okay, so we have if A is a type, if B is a type, then A plus B is a type. So that's a plus formation. Okay. And then you've seen if M is in A, then well, there, again, there are different notational conventions. And in left of M is A plus B, that's the one I happen to use. Uh, and if M is in B, let's say, then in right of M is A plus B. Okay. So those are the plus introduction rules, or two of them. And the elimination rule is a little, takes me a minute to write out. Because I have two introduction rules, so I have to account for the fact that there are two introduction rules, which means there are two ways to get back out what I got, what I put in. Okay, and so here's how that's expressed. Uh, the inversion of that. And it's expressed in a way that is a little bit uh, uh, looks complicated. So if I have this, okay, I have something which is an A or B. I want to express the idea that it's either in left or it's in right. So the way I'm going to express that idea is that to form a map out of A plus B, and this is a very important intuition, to form a map out of A plus B, a morphism out of A plus B, it's enough to form a map out of A, let's call it N, which is C. You take a map out of A, you take, oops, and you take a uh, map out of, out of B, well, let's call it P, which at this moment have the same type. I'll get back to that issue momentarily. Okay. If you give me these two bits of data, then I will, that's enough for me to form, or an even nicer way to run to write this is the following, because it emphasizes the mapping property. If you give me, oh, I don't call it X, how about if I call it Z? Okay, it's A plus B. Then case of X dot N and Y dot P, is C. So to form a map from A plus B to C, it's enough to give me a map from A to C and a map from B to C. That's a way of saying that A plus B contains only uh, a copy of A and a copy of B, and nothing else. Okay? So nothing else is implicit in the fact that I have a mapping from A plus B to C given only this data. If there were something else, like bottom or some other silly thing, then this would not be a valid rule. It should be a case of Z, right? What's that again? It should be a case of Z. Did I make a mistake? Uh, uh, what, what should be what? It should be a case of Z. It should be Z. Case. Case. case of Z. Case of Z. Well, yeah, if you want to be, I'm, I'm being loose about that kind of thing. OK, if you mean, should I parameterize the case by the result type? No, a case, case oh, of oh, Z. Oh, maybe that isn't what I meant. You need the product. I need C to be a prop, is that the Z. 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 Oh, thanks. Sorry. I, it can be very hard to see okay. while you're standing there. Thank you guys. Yeah, because this is just a concrete syntax for writing that. I have a map from A plus B to C called that. And if I want to, I can give a name to the argument and then supply it. it uh, that's, that's why I wasn't unable to see it momentarily. Okay, so uh, so that's just a. If you want named variables, which is what I'm using, then you should do what I wrote here. Okay, so uh, good. So those were the uh, those are the rules. So that's what we've had so far. 
Okay, good. So that's the what I call intuitionistic propositional logic. Okay, or simple type theory. Okay, perfect. Now the other thing that you discussed is when are two proofs or terms equal? And now this is where I need this is where things start to get complicated and interesting. Okay? So uh, first of all, it's an, in, an intellectual question, okay? Is what is proof equality? That's an interesting question. One should think about that. But I'll mention that before I write down a few things, what I'll mention is that uh, what equations I write down has no influence over what terms are well typed. Okay? But that will shortly not be the case. Okay, but right now I just want to mention this. So what I'm doing right now, I'm going to write down some equations, and in a sense, they're like nice things that you might enjoy. They don't have any force within the theory. But they are going to have some force within the theory, and then things become quite complicated. So that's a little foreshadowing. So you've already studied these things, and there's different terminology that one can have. Uh, but I will just use like uh, beta principle and beta principle. And eta principles are going to be thought of as uniqueness conditions. So this one I did with you last time, but let's just mention. So here you already know, so if I take, it's the Jensen's inversion principle, which is that the LM should cancel the interim. Okay, so that should be, I'll write triple bar. Okay, I'm not sure what everyone else has done. Okay, but I'll, I'll write triple bar. And in the end, I'm going to have to have a discussion with you about syntax, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so this will be kind of the, so those two things will turn out to be equal. So that's the inversion principle, okay, that says 11 cancels intro. That tends not to be very problematic or controversial in any way. The uniqueness principle, I'll, I'll state, and I, I went through the derivation last time, so let me just write the short version, which says if I take, and now I'm omitting what exactly are the typing premises and all that. So I'm, I'm I'm abbreviating in the interest of time and expecting you to be able to fill in things that I'm not right. So anything, uh, everything in the, in the product type is of the form of a pair whose first component is the first component of M. And you said, because these rules, if I take first of M, I'll get first of M. So first of that pair is first of M. So I'm identifying and saying, well, M can only be that pair. It can only be a pair, but not just any pair. It's that pair. Okay? That's what we're doing. Okay, good. So now over here, there can't be any beta rule because there's no intro to cancel with an limb. But there is a uniqueness principle. Okay? And the uniqueness principle is exactly the same one. It just says, if I form the null tuple, okay, from the... Uh, the limb forms apply to the there is no limb form at the end. I'm not so sure the So there, the, I, uh, the tuple consisting of all of the limb forms applied to the intro form, there are none. And so I said that that's equal to M and one. So everything in one is the null tuple. Okay, so again, over here you've seen them. Uh, this is a well-known thing that was originally called Gia, uh, which is that which says you plug in, and that's in B. If you give me an A index family of elements of B, and I give you a particular A, then I plug into that family and say, give me the nth uh, element of that family, and that will be the meaning of that uh, application or instantiation. And eta can be written in several forms, but the most concise one, and the one you probably have seen, is this one, and it's derived by an argument similar to the way I derived the one equation out of it. Really, it's derived from the universal property of the arrow, um, but uh, I won't go through that derivation right now. So it says everything in the arrow B it has the form of a lambda, and it's just the uh, an indirect jump. It just says, you know, if you call this, I call that. You know, it's just one level of indirection. It's a proxy. Okay, that's what I'm doing. So I'm defining a proxy. That's what a proxy is, after all. Okay? So I define a proxy for M. You call it, it calls M. Okay? So that's the idea. Okay, uh, so over here, what do we do? Well, there's, uh, let's see, there's uh, 
Is there a beta rule? No. Because I would have to have the limb, which exists now, canceling the intro, but there is no intro. I might have pronounced it that way with unit by accident. But there I can't do it because there's no limb to match to the intro. Here there's no intro to match to the limb, so there's no beta. Okay. But the question is what should be the uniqueness principle? What should we say for the uniqueness principle? Well, what would be the analog? Uh, in order to derive this, it's probably easier if I do this one first and get this as the nullary case of that in the same way that I got this as the nullary case of that. Okay, so let's jump over here and do it. So this is a little long-winded to write out, but if you're doing a case analysis and you have an in left, so let's call it P, then what is that? It plugs in P for X. Yeah, yeah. And that will be in C in this particular simple setup. And there's a similar thing, uh, the same, the exact same guy, but with in right of Q, let us call it, and that will be Q for Y and N. Okay? So that's easy, right? You have something which is a mapping, it's a mapping out property, case is a mapping out from the sum. If you give me an in left, and I do one thing, if you give me an in right, I do the other, those are the only two cases that are up. Now the question is, what should be the beta rule? Okay, what do we, what do we, what, what do we want to say about the uniqueness principle? So there's two things. So this has to be derived, okay, and this has to be derived. <coughs> okay, so what is it that we want to say? Okay, well let's remember what the co-product diagram looked like. That's the thing that's going to help us the most. Actually. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so. We have A injects into A plus B, and we have B injects into A plus B, and we have the property that if M, 